Welcome to worship for this first Sunday of the month of March, the week of March 7th, 2021. It's wonderful to welcome you all to worship. Even if we're not gathered together in physical presence, we are certainly united by the Spirit of God. And as we come together, I thank you for being a part of our worshiping body today. As we begin our time of worship, I do have some announcements for our cause. Some of you may have noticed we had some technical glitches last week with the software we use to produce the service, with the software we use to produce DVDs and CDs. I apologize for that. We hope that's been rectified for the coming week. Uh, if you did receive a faulty CD or DVD and would like a replacement, of course, please let me know. Just uh, give me a call at extension 3013 or from outside the building 303-937-3013. Also, uh, good news to announce, we are planning on resuming in-person worship here at Eaton, West Alameda Community Baptist Church, on Palm Sunday this year. That's March 28th, uh, the last Sunday of this month. You will receive a letter with all of the details if we know of your existence. Uh, if, if you've just been joining us for worship and we don't know you have, but you would like to receive that letter, again, please give my office a call at 3013. Otherwise, you'll be receiving that letter in the next week. Uh, just some notes, we will require masks as we begin worship. Chairs will be spaced out on a plan that we have in place to ensure that social distancing. And there will be some changes in the worship service as well so, uh, to ensure that we adhere to safe uh, gathering standards. One thing is we do need RSVPs. Uh, we need to know, at least as we begin this return to worship, how many are expecting to be with us here in person uh, so we can set up the centrum appropriately. So if you are sure you're going to be joining us or not joining us, I encourage you to give me a call, extension 3013, and, and certainly feel free to leave a message if I'm not there. Uh, a final note there, if you watch the service online or from receiving a, a DVD or a CD, there will be some changes to the schedule as well when we begin our in-person worship again. Uh, details will be included in that letter that I mentioned. Now I invite you to prepare your hearts and your minds for worship as we center our hearts, our minds on things above. Hear these words now from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my lips. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come, let us exalt his name together. Amen. And now let us enter into our time of worship as we hear this prelude prepared especially for us by our worship accompanist, Sharon Smaldone, The Invitation.
Please pray with me. O oh, gracious and loving God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather in this time of worship, we pray, Lord, that our hearts would be opened to your spirit. May the spirit truly lead and guide our time of worship together. Bless, Lord, the words we speak, the songs we hear and sing, the prayers we offer. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. As we gather together in worship today, please hear these words of call to worship. We come today to worship from different places, yet God is always near. We come to worship for different reasons, yet God meets us here. We experience God's presence in different ways, yet it is God who draws us all together. We thank you, O oh God, for gathering us together in this time of worship. Amen. Jesus calls us to love one another. That's one of the basic tenets of our faith. And how better to love one another than to offer prayers of joy and concern. Today, in hospitals and rehabs, Bobby Hansen and Katie Moe. Also, further concerns for Robbie Krug, Catalina Rodriguez, Liz Rojas, Jan Whitfield, and Art Zies. We also pray for Lynette Gower's upcoming surgery and Lisa Hackinson's asking for prayers for her brother, Scott, whose son, Cody, passed away. And of course, he's also Lisa's nephew. Rod Smith is celebrating the birth of a great granddaughter. We ask for peace in our world, loving and respecting each other. We need to build that, do that more. We are praising the develop of, development of several COVID vaccines. And also we ask for patience in waiting for that vaccine. Continued patience and understanding of safety measures taken to curb these um, virus attacks. And even though we'll be vaccinated, we still need to acknowledge uh, social distancing, wearing a mask, hand washing. And we are thanking residents who continue to do that. We pray heartily for those who have been diagnosed with the coronavirus and also health care workers who are caring for them. Again, we give thanks to God for this time of prayer, being able to take our community concerns to God and our joys and also our personal ones. Take this time for silent prayer. God of grace and mercy, we thank you for giving us breath and life. We have gathered in your name because we want to feel your presence. Give us eyes to see you all around us and ears to hear you speaking your life and love into our hearts. <clears throat> Sometimes we find it hard to see you, hard to hear you, hard to believe that you are really with us. In these moments of doubt, remind us that you are always near, that your love is bigger than our fears, and that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, we can do that will make you turn away from us. As we enter into this time of hope for the pandemic to receive, for vaccinations to become widely available and accepted, for the opening up of activities and togetherness, and for the easing of fear and division. We continue to trust you with what we don't understand and cannot anticipate. We pray for officials, 
locally and especially worldwide to create some quiet time, looking to you for guidance. We pray for all children of the world who have endured a challenging year, both academically and socially, that they all will soon be able to return to in-person learning, opening their minds to new information, being caring and loving to their peers and teachers, trusting in an unpredictable but very loving world. Help us to love all as you do, especially the unloved, and to ask forgiveness for ourselves and for others. In you, Lord, we are refreshed and renewed, and we praise you for who you are and the gifts you share with us. God, we are yours. Holy Spirit, fill our homes. Jesus, give us new life as we pray together the prayer you have lovingly taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapters 9, verses 33 through 37. They came from Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Violinist Joshua Bell made quite a splash when he entered the classical musical world with his debut with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra at the age of 17. His playing was described as nothing short of amazing, and he would go on to have an exceptional career that really proves that today. His charisma, stage presence, and just sheer playing talent on the violin caused many to believe that he was the new Itzhak Perlman, and his career has kind of borne that out. He's also known among those who have worked with him closely and even those who just met him briefly as an extremely friendly, outgoing, and humble man. But he's acknowledged in numerous interviews that that, that was a skill, a character trait that he had to learn a little bit as a young man. After his blockbuster debut, he followed that up with a, a solo violin CD that sold way more copies than classical recordings typically ever do. And he was in demand. He was gaining more fame, more adulation than most teenagers really can cope with. He tells of one story shortly after his first CD had gone gold that turned into a wake-up lesson in humility for him. His agent had arranged for him to make an appearance at and offer support and encouragement to the inner city high school orchestra program in his hometown of Bloomington, Indiana. He hated things like that, but, but he knew the publicity would be good, and so he went. He, he admits he kind of just went through the paces, the motions. He listened politely to various young musicians play, listened to the orchestra rehearse, offered a, a few tips, he played along for a couple of good photo opportunities, and then he slipped out as soon as he could. 
On the way out of that high school where the event was being held, he was, he was stopped by a couple of young boys, just students at that school, not part of the orchestra. They went up to him wide-eyed, like they were approaching the most famous Hollywood star, anyone famous that you could imagine, and they said, you're Joshua Bell, aren't you? Uh, the other one said, you're really famous, aren't you? Bill's head, he said, was, was swelling and he was prepared to give them autographs and maybe take pictures with them. Yes, he replied, I'm Joshua Bell, the violinist. I'm the one who was on the symphony concert on TV last week and, and just released my best-selling CD. They looked at him puzzled, crestfallen for a minute. Oh, the one finally said, sorry, we thought, we thought that you were the Joshua Bell who had the top five scores on the Super Pac-Man video game down the street at the arcade. And with that, they walked off with nary an autograph or photograph request to be had. Bell laughed while he was telling the story and he told the man interviewing him that that was a lesson for him. No matter how good you think you are, how important you think you are, someone out there sees through the facade and could not care less. Oftentimes I think it's parents who have that God-given role, but in Bell's case, it was just two random high school students. The final thing that had even the interview rolling on the floor with laughter was that Bell acknowledged that it was, in fact, he who had those amazing scores on that video game. He was just too taken aback to admit that to those two boys who weren't adulating him for what he thought were the right reasons at the time. <laughs> you know, we all in life seek to have a good self-image. Taken at that level, there, there's nothing wrong with that. That's an okay thing. It's a, it's a key factor in good mental health and I think a happy life. But we Americans, actually to be fair, I should say we human beings often aren't content with just a healthy self-image. We seek adulation and affirmation from others, from everyone all too often, and, and humility gets banished from both our, our vocabularies and our lives. A best-selling book in 1977 illustrates that point. It was self-published because its author, Robert Ringer, knew that he had a message that everyone needed to hear even though no regular book publishers were at all interested in it, even after he pointed out that he had had a very well-selling self-published book in 1973 entitled Winning Through Intimidation. His 1977 book carried the title Looking Out for Number One, and it sold over two million copies, a bestseller, number one on the New York Times list for quite a while. It's still being sold now actually by a, a regular publisher, Simon & Schuster. Ringer, Ringer, the author of that book, claims probably with some truthfulness that the message of the book has been distorted and it's not as bad, as crass as what the title might make it seem. But just looking through the table of contents seems to kind of affirm that the core of the book lines up with its title. It's about how you can be above others, better than others, how you can achieve things with the goal of having people look up to you. And at the acceptable, according to Roger, according to Ringer rather, at the acceptable cost often of using people, even trampling them on the way up the ladder. In other words, it appeals to that very tendency within our human nature that Jesus spent so much time teaching about, warning against, the idea that the ultimate goal in life is to win at any cost, to, to be number one, to have more honor and respect and adulation than those around you do. While the disciples who were walking with Jesus on this final trip to Jerusalem where he himself, Jesus, will humbly submit to the cross for us, those folks had never read Ringer's book. They, they certainly somehow had taken in some of his concepts. If you read all of chapter eight and chapter nine of Mark's gospel together, you'll get a feeling for the dissonance of their behavior uh, contrasted with the setting of what's going on. We heard Lynn describe that this morning. 
Just previously in chapter nine before our reading today, they as a, a group have been confronted by a father who had asked them to heal, the disciples to heal, perhaps cast out a, a demon that is causing his son's convulsion, convulsions and inability to speak. They had failed in their efforts to do that. So, so the father had gone over their heads. He, he'd gone to the boss, so to speak, to Jesus himself. Jesus meets him, rebukes the crowd, calling them a faithless generation, and then proceeds to heal the young boy. But the disciples' abject failure in the matter were there for all to see. And then Jesus, for the, the second time, right before the scene we're looking at today, tells them how this trip to Jerusalem will end. He will be betrayed and crucified. He will die. The first time he did that, Peter got in trouble for insisting that he, fierce, brave, loyal Peter, would never let that happen. This time, as they're walking to Capernaum, a city on the shore of Galilee, we find the disciples having an argument, almost a, a skirmish, it seems, in what they hope is out of Jesus' earshot, over who will be number one. Jesus sees the kerfuffle, though, and eventually asks what this skirmish is all about. They're too embarrassed to answer because the truth is, even after hearing Jesus prophesying about his own death, their focus, their argument is over who is number one among them, who is the teacher's pet, and more importantly, perhaps, who will be the leader of the gang when Jesus is put to death. It's a stunning thing to see in this group who have been with Jesus for, for over two years now, have, have shared their lives, have grown to love Jesus, have been loved by Jesus. They think their silence to that question will put an end to the matter, but Jesus, of course, knows what it was all about. So when they get to Capernaum, to the house, as verse 33 puts it, Jesus goes into teaching mode remedial teaching mode, actually, for, for this is a lesson that they've heard countless times before, but obviously they've still not quite taken it in. Capernaum, as I said, is, is a lakeside town. It's, it's near where Jesus called those first four disciples, all fishermen, to follow him and become fishers of people. In a show of amazing faith, they lay down their nets and they follow him. He becomes their rabbi, their teacher, and they become his students, his disciples. But any relationship like that is not without its challenges, and today's passage points that out in big, bold letters. Capernaum, where Jesus is in this scene, where the disciples are, has been Jesus' kind of home base for these first half, these first years of his ministry. They were focused on the region around Galilee. The house in question, many biblical scholars believe, could have been Peter's or Andrew's or, or maybe someone else, another disciple or someone else in the entourage. In any case, the moment they're in the house, Jesus goes into teaching, into full rabbi mode. He sits down. That's a sign of that teaching about to take place, and the lesson begins. But being a good teacher, he uses a visual aid this time to drive the point home, a visual aid in the form of a young child, probably a toddler, somewhere between one and three years old, based on the Greek word that's used there. Some speculate the child in question might have been Peter's. We, we know Peter was married, his mother-in-law is mentioned in the Gospels, but never his wife by name or any mention of whether he actually had children himself. In any case, it's, it's clear that this is a child familiar with the people hanging around the house that day. He's in the midst of it all, and certainly probably familiar and fond of Jesus himself. The heart of Jesus' message here is one that we preachers and seminary types call reversal. Jesus uses this theme, this technique, a lot. You know what I'm talking about, even if you don't know it by that label, reversal. You know phrases like, the humble will be exalted and the mighty shall fall. The poor shall be rich and the rich shall be poor. The servant shall be served. Anyone who wants to be first in God's eyes, in God's kingdom, must be last in the eyes of the world. To be faithful to what God wants from you, you must be the humble servant of all. So much for looking out for number one, huh? 
Then to drive the point home, he, he takes the young child, one who is, again, likely hanging around in the midst of this lesson, stands the child up next to him and, and then places him among the disciples, a visual aid of sorts. And that's because their culture, this would have been a little more shocking, had a little more impact than it might in our own, more than we can fathom without learning a little something about that culture. You see, children back then really had no value. Now, I do not mean they weren't loved by their parents. Of course they were. But legally, in the eyes of that culture, they had no value because they had no legal rights, no status, and most importantly of all, no, none of that cultural currency that drove so much of thinking in that Mediterranean region then. They had no honor. Honor was the the mortar of much of the social world back then, maximizing those who owed you respect and favors and minimizing owing others that kind of obligation. You moved up in society by mingling with doing favors for those higher than you on the ladder and by avoiding those lower than you on the social esteem scale. That mindset is, is what is at the heart of this discussion the disciples had on the roadside that we looked at today. It was important to the disciples to know who had the greatest honor among them, who was literally number one in Jesus' eyes, so much so that they forgot all of the lessons in humility and in not valuing the things of the culture above the things of God that Jesus had been teaching them. So much so that when Jesus asked them what they were discussing, they couldn't even bring themselves to admit it. They had a mindset of seeking to be above the others, of having superior status, social position, prioritizing yourself above all else. And that's never something that God can use to build his kingdom. Mahatma Gandhi was that famous Indian leader at the turn of the, 19, or the 20th century, early, early 1900s. He was that famous Indian revolutionary, so important to Indians, independence from Great Britain, one of the founders of the nonviolent resistance movement. He, in his autobiography, tells of an incident that happened to him when he was a, a law student in London in the late 1800s. He'd been raised a Hindu in the Hindu religion, but he'd heard things about Jesus, particularly his teaching about humility and self-sacrifice that he liked a lot. Jesus really intrigued him. So one Sunday he decided to go to church to learn more, to hear about this man and, and the people who called themselves by his name. He went to a nearby Anglican church for the worship service, a building that he described as a huge Gothic pile of stone, intimidating just to look at, much less to enter. But he did enter. And as he was a few steps away from entering the sanctuary for the service, he was met confronted really by an usher who firmly told him that, quote, your kind aren't welcome here. He suggested that Gandhi might want to try the Methodist chapel down the road. They might possibly let him sit in the back row of the balcony there, but he certainly wasn't welcome at this church. Gandhi left, never having attended that worship service. The experience, though, caused him to speak one of the sayings that is still among his most quoted. He said, I very much like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And I'm convinced that day too, Jesus wept. More than anything else, after he left this planet, Jesus wanted the disciples he was walking with and talking with and those of us who follow in their footsteps today to live lives that preach the gospel that he brought to us. And that can only be achieved not by looking out for number one, but by recognizing that the last will be first, the humble will be exalted, and we are called not to be served, but to serve. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for today's lesson, a reminder truly, God, of priorities that we confess all too often go astray. Thank you, God, for reminding us that to be first in the kingdom, we must be last in the eyes of those around us. To be
be exalted, we must be humble. We thank you, God, for the servant's heart that you place within each of us as we trust in Christ. And we pray that we might be faithful to his words this day and always. We pray this in his name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our closing hymn today is an old favorite, a classic, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. You'll find the words on the screen. I encourage you to sing along. Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise thy mountain fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming As you go forth after this time of worship together, I invite you to receive these words of blessing and benediction. Loving and gracious God, we go forth strengthened by our time together, enlightened by your word. God, we ask for your strength and your wisdom. Light our paths and guide our footsteps. Truly God, give us hearts to be disciples of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. <laughs>